is going to record the meeting. <laughs> um, well, everybody, thank you very much for uh, jumping on and, and, and joining us for our first in a series. This is the Let's Chat series in which uh, PedNet staff and some of our MRT staff will give presentation and talks about things they're really interested in and hope that the community is interested in. And our first up talk is gonna be with me. Uh, my name is Lawrence Simonson. And we're gonna be talking about the upcoming park sales tax initiative, as well as how that relates to building trails in Columbia. And as everybody knows, uh, our vision here at PedNet are, is towns built for people where it's easy to walk, bike, ride public transit, and everybody can get where they want to go. And trails play an important role in that initiative, mostly because we feel that trails are the most accessible form of non-motorized transportation infrastructure out there. And when I say what I mean by accessible is they feel safe for everybody, about everybody can use them. You know, sometimes when people are trying to walk on the sidewalks or walk on the roads, those areas don't always feel safe for everybody, but people tend to love the trails. And the trails also have benefits that go well beyond just getting out and getting a little bit exercise. They're a great infrastructure piece that allows for conservation. They are great for economic development. They are a, an attractor of talent and other businesses because people wanna live near trails and around trails. Um, so the, the, the benefit to trails is really endless. And so as we kind of talk tonight, um, the, the whole basis is with this upcoming park sales tax, it's gonna play a, a huge role in the development of our trails. And based on what trails are in the park sales tax will really set the tone and the pace at which we get trails built here in Columbia over the next 10 years, if not longer. So with that, a um, little bit about our agenda for this evening. The presentation should go pretty fast, somewhere around 30 to 35 minutes of me just talking. However, if you have a question or would like to get some clarification on something, please feel free to put it in the chat and I'll do my best to read that and answer it. If I don't see it, Gabby will, will capture that and ask me that question and she'll, she's plenty happy to interrupt me. So uh, what the agenda will entail is we're gonna talk about what is the park sales tax to get us started. We're gonna talk a little bit about some survey data that was done on our park system. I'll also then go through the, the project list and show you what's on the project list. So what is to be built with the park sales tax revenue that is brought in. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about our analysis, PedNet's analysis of the project list, particularly as it relates to trails, trail funding and, and, and the building of trails. And then we're gonna talk about how we feel about the, the, the project list and the park sales tax in general. Uh, talk a little bit about our recommendations and what we need to do if we want to see more trails built in Columbia in the next 10 years. So with that, I'll move on a little bit. So park sales tax, what is it? Um, in Columbia, we are very fortunate that we have a sales tax, a dedicated sales tax that funds our parks and rec department. It's something not a lot of communities have. And because we have it, we are well known for our parks in Columbia. People really enjoy the parks, people love the parks. And without this, we probably wouldn't have all the parks that we have. We wouldn't have all the trails that we have. So this is a wonderful thing. And it was first uh, brought in, the first time we adopted the park sales tax was in November of 2000. And what it was really for was to build out Stevens Lake Park. And back then Stevens Lake Park, as far as I, I wasn't living here, but as far as I understand, it was kind of contentious and people didn't want to spend money on it. And now it is really quite the jewel. Um, I, it's one of the reasons I moved to Columbia when I first came to visit Columbia and decide if I wanted to live here. I drove past Stevens Lake Park. I saw all the bike lanes. I got to experience the trails. And it is what gave me the determining factor of where I wanted to live. And, and it brought me here to Columbia. That park sales tax has been renewed three times, once in 2005, 2010, and 2015. And it generally generates about $2.9 million per year. And they use that money to fund 
parks and rec capital projects and land acquisition. And this is a really great thing because this means that funding doesn't come from general revenue, from the city's general run revenue to fund uh, parks facilities in general, most of the time, I'm gonna say. Occasionally it does happen, but almost most of the time it never does. And they are kind of their own self-operating um, unit. So they actually have a quarter cent sales tax. Uh, one of those, an eighth of that is permanent. So that's not what we will be voting on in November. We'll be voting on the eighth cent renewal in November um, because the current renewable park sales tax expires on March 31st of 2020. Um, and hopefully that passes. It's, it's my, um, my hope that that ballot net, ballot initiative passes in November of 2021. That way on April 1st of 2022, we continue to see the benefits uh, of the revenue that's brought in from that tax. The one big change is previously uh, the sales tax, the renewable sales tax has been on a kind of a five-year cycle. We have to renew it every five years. This last time it was on a six-year cycle. Um, they are now moving it to a 10-year cycle. So keep in mind that, that that is one of the big changes from previous park sales tax renewable um, taxes to this one is that they are moving to a 10 cent sales tax, or excuse me, a 10 year tax. So why is the park sales tax important as particularly from a PedNet perspective and a trail perspective? It's because this is the primary, primary way trails are funded here in Columbia. Um, in the past, we have had some funds from uh, the Get About grant that was part of a non-motorized uh, transportation pilot program that was given to us through the federal government. However, those funds have basically run out, and so those funds are no longer available. We've used those funds to build a few trails in Columbia and build a lot of infrastructure. That's where a lot of the bike lanes came from. Um, a trail you can think of that was built using the Get About funds was the Shepherd to Rollins Trail. The, it's the most recent trail that was built um, well, it's actually the second most recent trail that was built. We just are about to open up another one uh, here very soon. But that money has since been spent. And now any trails moving forward that we are going to build in Columbia, the, the mechanism is through the park sales tax. So in order to see more trails built in Columbia, it's got to come really from this park sales tax. And so the way it's going to come through this park sales tax is if it's put on the project list that is generally determined right as the sales tax is voted on. So what we wanna talk about next is a little bit about community input. One of the things I really love about Parks and Rec Department is they are very good with their public engagement process. Um, they are constantly talking to the community about their parks. Um, they have their phone number everywhere. So if there's ever a problem, they're very easy to get a hold of and work with. They're constantly reaching out to the community and asking the community what they want, what things are you using, what things need improved. I think they do a phenomenal job. They have their own master plan. So I, I think they are an exemplary department within the, the city. And one of the things they do is they put out a survey um, quite frequently, particularly before the, the park sales tax usually comes up to ask people, what facilities are you using most often? And one of the things that um, I really took a look at was what facilities are residents using over the past 12 months? I know in the last 12 months we've had COVID, so this influences it a little bit, but looking at previous data, it really didn't shift the numbers as much as I thought it would. It pretty much landed about the where it landed the last time they had this community input, um, give or take some percentage points here and there. The thing I wanna point out to everybody is what you will see is the number one most used park facility is walking, hiking, and biking trails by far, even so much so that the second one is nature trails. Um, I really thought playgrounds was gonna be the top winner here. Uh, playgrounds is down to about 29% of Colombians use, use those facilities. So biking, walking, and hiking trails are really what we love here in Columbia to use. You'll see a little bit further down on that list, I, I've, I've put in a red box there, soccer fields and Columbia Sports Fieldhouse. I, I'm pointing these out um, because I will bring these up a little bit later in the presentation. And I wanna point out that those are used at about a, a rate of 6% each. So it's about 6% of people have used those in the, the, the last 12 months. 
So the other thing that Parks and Rec does is they ask households, what needs do you have? What types of park facilities do you want to see more of um, built here in Columbia? And I think that's really good because it keeps them ahead of the trends. I know years ago, we didn't have any kind of pickleball facilities here. And because they asked the question quite frequently, what kind of things do we need to be doing to keep, to keep up with, with the public? They heard about pickleball. And so we started to have pickleball courts here. And the thing that really is amazing to me is even with the number of trails that we have and considering ourselves a trail city, 71% of residents still say that they need access to walking and biking trails. So it's a high demand uh, infrastructure piece that we have here in Columbia that people still want more of. And again, I'm gonna point out a couple of things down here that are more important to be, to just remember as I get a little later in the presentation that as far as indoor basketball, volleyball and pickleball courts, about 15% of households are asking for those facilities and about 14% are asking for baseball and softball fields. Again, that'll come up here in a little bit. So now I wanna talk about the project list. So when they, and this is one of the things I really like about parks um, is they go and they present, hey, community, city council, we wanna re-up this one, one eighth cent renewable sales tax for the next 10 years. And what they are really good at doing is saying, with that money that we bring in, these are the exact things we're gonna do with that money. And I think that's really great because we now know everything that they're gonna spend the money on. And if they put a bunch of stuff in there that the community doesn't want, um, the community may vote it down. But they do a really good job, as I mentioned, asking the community, what types of things do you want? And then they go and figure out, well, what kinds of things can we then do based on what the community is asking for in the next round of, of the sales tax? And then they put together this, this big list and they say, okay, if the voters approve the next round of sales tax, this is exactly what we're gonna do with it. And in 10 years, when the sales tax is up for renewal again, we will have completed this entire list and we will generate a new list for the next sales tax. And this list is quite extensive. Uh, I've broken it up into sections, as you'll see here, as I move through my slides. The first section is the land acquisition and annual parks fund. I call this the miscellaneous section. This is things that, you know, if they get an opportunity to buy some land that they will eventually be able to put a park on, they have the money there and available to do it. Um, some, you know, miscellaneous park improvements pop up that they didn't know were gonna pop up because something breaks or whatever. That's where this is as well. So any kind of maintenance things that kind of pop up, they also have some equipment replacements. So if some, a swing is wear, wearing out or if a, one of their trucks is worn out um, over the next 10 years, they can replace that. And they even have some scholarship stuff in here. So I call this kind of the miscellaneous section. And, and as I look at it, I think it's really great. I think they've done a, a fair job of, of the amount of money that they've designated to this category. The next category, and, and probably one of the biggest, one of the two biggest categories is what's known as improvement to existing parks and facilities. So this is as they look at the stuff we already have and they say, okay, you know, this, this facility, we absolutely know that this tennis court, we need to resurface it. So at this park, we are gonna have to spend this amount of money to resurface this tennis court. And so then they put it into this section. So as you can see things such as like the arc improvements, they need to replace the, the water play structure and the natatorium paint and the general indoor improvements. So they know they gotta get that paint improved. They know they have to replace the play structure. So they put it in here as this improvement. Um, so that's really what goes into this area. Some of those improvements that they say needed in parks facilities. The thing I'll point out in this one um, that is this Columbia Sports Fieldhouse phase two. And again, this will have more context as I continue to go through my presentation. The Columbia Sports Fieldhouse phase two uh, construction for about $5.3 million. And if, if you are not familiar with what the Columbia Sports Fieldhouse is, um, it's a facility down by Phillips A Park. It's on the south side of town. Um, this is phase one um, that I have a picture of. I don't have a picture of phase two but the amount of money they're dedicating to it is very much this very close to what they dedicated for the phase one and they're going to build facilities somewhat similar so i'm using that um, 
picture of phase one. So just in transparency, this won't be what phase two looks like. Um, but keep in mind, as I talked about earlier, when I showed you what people have been asking for, only about 15% of the community is asking for more indoor facilities such as these, and only about 6% of the Columbia population used this, this facility within the last year. Um, and I was one of those 6% that did use it. So uh, I was grateful that we have it. The next uh, category on the park list is the new facilities. This is a, a smaller category. So this is anytime they know that something new is coming down the pipe that they're gonna be doing with their parks money. So some of this is, and, and really a lot of it is neighborhood parks. So they know like say a subdivision is being put in, it's on the city to put in a playground. And so that's what a lot of this is, is a new playground, sometimes in a subdivision. Um, so that's really what really is in here. The other the piece that's important to point out here is the Northeast Regional Park Development. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with that terminology, this is the fairgrounds. Um, and it, we, I'll talk about it here in a second, but they have that budgeted in at $4.1 million within this category. Uh, I mentioned that it's the, the fairgrounds. So if, if any of you have been to the fairgrounds, it's off, off of Old 63 and Oakland Gravel Road area. And for a long time, the county was trying to offload this onto the city and eventually did um, give it to the city for more or less. And the city says, we'll develop it. And as part of that development, these are the things they're wanting to put in, in that kind of land. They're wanting to put in um, some soccer fields. It's about six soccer fields in there, a track, a uh, rubberized track, and four baseball diamonds, and a, a little playground, and then they're still gonna utilize it for the fair uh, on an annual basis, as I understand. So that's what this money is, is being dedicated to. And, and finally, our favorite section here at PedNet is the trails and green belts. So this is the section that all the trail stuff is, is, is line itemed out. And as we look at this list, the things I wanna point out to you um, this includes things like parking lots as well. So like a parking lot at a for a trailhead, which are, are good things, bridge replacements for the MKT. Those bridges are getting well over a hundred years old and they need to be replaced. So it has also in this. Um, the, the three things I wanna point out here are uh, the new trail constructions. So within this line item category, there are two new trails that they are proposing to be built. Um, this is the Percy Creek Trail phase two, and I'll talk a little bit about about uh, where those are. So if you don't have to use your brain to try and figure out where some of this is. And the Hinkson Creek Trail, uh, Clark Lane, to, I can't pronounce that, the next word, but Clark Lane area. Um, and I wanna point out the total budget for this, not just the total budget for the two trails, the total budget for the entire category is $3.14 million. So that's gonna be important as we move through this discussion as well. Um, I mentioned those two trails that are, are, are in there as a line item. Those two trails, this is the 30, year, the 30 mile loop that we talk about a lot. And it has a, is a very popular and something we're very excited about. Parks and Rec talks about it a lot. City Council talks about it a lot. In fact, they use this as this thing is coming. This is gonna be here when they're trying to get businesses to, to come to town, as they're trying to get new employees to come to town. This is an amenity that's often used as, as, as something to bring them in and entice them. Those two trail projects that I just mentioned that are in there as line items are these red in these red circles. The one off to the left is the, um, is the Percy Creek extension and the one off to the right is gonna be the newer Hinkson Creek extension. Just so you have an understanding of where that is, the circle on the right, the, the Hinkson Creek extension area is gonna be over there by Socket Internet, by uh, Home Depot, Bass Pro Shop area. And then the, the Percy Creek extension there off to the left, that is the area that is around, just gonna be north of Gillespie Bridge Road, if those that are familiar with Gillespie Bridge Road. So those are the two sections that are being proposed. A little bit, I see a question there in the comments. See if I can look at those. Uh, 
looks like Avery has a question. Avery? Hey, Lawrence. Uh, I, can you help me? I'm, I'm a little bit lost. Are these budgetary uh, numbers for the coming up fiscal year, or is that for the duration of this park sales tax? It would be for the duration of the 10 years. So not okay. for the next year, not for the next year, but for 10 over the next 10 years, starting on April 1 of 2022, 10 years from that point, it would cost, I think it's like one point, I'm not having on my screen now, $1.4 million to build, you know, the, the Percy Creek Trail, for instance. That's what they have dedicated over the next 10 years. Does that okay. answer your question? Thank you. Yeah. Yep. There's a little bit more zoomed in, more detailed look of where the trail, those two trails would go. Um, the one on the left is that Hershey Creek Trail starts there at Gillespie Bridge Road on the very south end down here. And then it goes up north here and eventually loops around and connects to what's known as Smith Drive. The other trail, the proposed Hinkson Creek Trail down here is where it would start. Um, that's right by Socket Internet there. And then it would go up here, and then there's a the little roundabout right here. It's it's kind of Mexico gravel area. So this is Mexico gravel. These all over here are the Bass Pro Shops to give you an understanding of kind of where this trail it is. So over the next ten years, these would be the only two trails built as of right now. And to get put you into context, that's 2.5 miles of trails over the next ten years, and we're going to continue to talk about that. So I'm moving a little bit to our analysis of not only what Col the Colombians have said they want, but then also the, the actual like amount allocated for spending. So as we talk through all those lists of all the surveys and what Colombians have asked for, it boils down to basically trails flat out are the highest use park facility in Colombia. 81% uh, of residents say they use our trail facilities, which is huge. Uh, especially when you hear people complain that say no one ever uses the trails. Well, I, I, I dare them to go on, on the MKT trail uh, on a Saturday late morning and, and not think that it's not just a traffic jam of people walking and biking and running and it's a wonderful thing. Trails also have the highest need as, as stated by Columbia residents, over 71% of residents have identified that they need access to additional, additional walking and biking trails. That's roughly 34,000 households, not 34,000 people, households. So that's a huge chunk of our population is saying, please give us more trails. A number most people don't know because a lot of times we boast that we are a trail city is that Columbia falls well below the standard for recommended miles of trails per person. In fact, just to meet the standard, we would need 93 more miles of trails to meet that standard. And that seems a little bit confusing to all of us, but the reason that is, is because while we don't meet the standard, the trails we do have are amazing. As I travel around the state, as I travel around the country, I do go to towns that have more trails than we do. Um, some do a really good job, some don't do a really good job, but the trails that we do have are some of the most beautiful scenic trails that I've ever seen. And I think it's because our parks department doesn't just build the trail, they also do conservation around the trail, which makes them beautiful and gives us lots of green space and makes them just a wonderful place to be. However, the fact of the matter is, is we are quite short on the number of miles to meet the standard. And another thing I wanna point out is currently the access for trails in wards two and three, those are the wards that are north of I-70, if you're not familiar, those wards have very little access to trail. They do have the Bear Creek Trail, um, but other than that, they really don't have as much access as the, the south, southern, more southern parts of Columbia, so anything south of I-70. So as I look at this, um, I think, well, why is that? And, and the real reason is, is because over the last 30 years, we have spent all of the money on that southern section. And it's time now to start thinking like, okay, we need to move some of this to the north. And if we don't start spending in the north, it's going to be quite a, while, a long time till we get trails up there. I see a question by DDoc on what organization set the trail person standard. Um, I'm, I'm going to get this a little wrong, but it's the Missouri, it's either Missouri Parks and Rec, State Parks and Rec or the Missouri Department of Natural Resources. 
one of those two. I can look that up and, and, and get that to you, D, if, if you really want to see it. But um, yeah, it's what it's the state departments, DNR or Parks and Rec on the state level that has that standard. Okay, moving on. Um, so as I mentioned, there's this huge demand for parks or, or for, for trails in Columbia. So let's look at how the, the funding is actually allocated versus the community identified wants and uses. As we look at the, the project list and we run the numbers, only 8.8% .8 of the total project funding is for new trail construction. And that's for that Hershey Creek Trail phase two and the Hinkson Creek Trail. Um, we, we really think that trails um, are very important, partially because trails serve the needs of people who live here in Columbia. Um, it's always great to think about attracting, um, you know, other people's money through tourism. Um, but the fact of the matter is that the people here in Columbia use trails heavily. And in contrast, when we look at the project list, 33% of the total project funding is for new facilities for regional sports teams and sports tourism. And that's from that 5.3 million for the Columbia Sports Fieldhouse uh, phase two, and yet only 6% of residents have visited that in the, in the last year. And then the other part of that comes from the, uh, the, the fairgrounds stuff. So when we put that in perspective, the entire trails green belts category. So remember how they had everything split out into categories, you know, kind of the what I called the miscellaneous category, the upgrades, the new facilities, and then the trails and green belts category. When we look at all those categories, the entire category for trails and green belts budget over the next 10 years is 3.14 million which is less than a single item, sports field house at 5.3 million and a single item, the fairgrounds at 4.1 million. Uh, Tom Groth asked uh, how many miles completed of the entire 30 mile loop. Currently we estimate it's around 15 to 20 miles are completed in the entire loop. Um, and even as we park, talk to Parks and Rec, that's kind of what they say. It kind of all depends on um, how the 30 mile loop eventually lands. Is it gonna be right at 30 or is it gonna be 32 or 33 because of the way the trails will eventually wiggle either through a creek or through a neighborhood. So um, there's some estimating there, but that's about what it is. It's about 15 to 20. So uh, talking a little bit more about this, the tax, and the amount of trails being built and going against the or going up against the uh, the funding, how is it allocated? The current draft, and I want to make sure I emphasize that, is that the current draft park sales tax, it's a draft, so it can be changed, only will build 2.5 miles of new trails over the next 10 years. Putting that into perspective, Columbia began building the 30 mile trail loop with the MKT trail in the 1980s. At the current rate, the 10 to 15 miles remaining in the 30 mile loop will be completed in the 2060s. That's roughly 80 years after construction began. Um, and when we ran that number, and, and granted those are some, some just kind of generalized estimates based on pace and what can be done, our hearts kind of sank because we were all kind of hoping that we would be able to ride this 30 mile loop at some point in our lifetime. Um, let's see, we have a couple questions. We have a question here before I move on to the next thing. Which of the proposed facilities will generate revenue? How much and where will the dollars go? Um, I don't have an analysis of the trail facilities and how much they generate. Um, you know, arts, the art people in the arts are really good at talking about the revenue that the arts bring in to Columbia as, as a, a way to generate funding. Um, par Parks has not done, a, as far as I understand, any kind of analysis of the amount of money trails bring in both from tourism, but also bringing in just being an attractor for talent and other businesses. The other facilities uh, bring in, don't make any money. They generally try to break even on operation. So when they build, say, the sports field house, the money that they bring in for the sports field house, they generally shoot to pay for operations. 
So they don't try to bring in a whole ton of money over that. Um, they don't charge money above to help pay for the capital cost of those projects. So the money brought in for the, say the sports field house will not go towards building the sports field house. It only pays for the operations of that sports field house. Um, but there is some discussion and I completely agree with it. The sports field house and things like the fairgrounds, some of the stuff up there will bring in money to our community through uh, tourism. So hotel stays as well as restaurants and things like that. Um, so back to the, the number of trails being built, as I mentioned in the, the park sales tax, only 2.5 miles of trails will be built over the next 10 years as it stands now within the current draft. Um, as I mentioned, means we're gonna be finishing that 30 mile loop in about the 2060s. Uh, another thing to put into context here is the 2015 park sales tax, the one that's about to expire in, in uh, 2022. That was a six year cycle and it had 2.5 miles of trails in it. So as we continue to move forward, the rate at which we are gonna be building trails is, is technically slowing down. So what is our position, and I'm, and I'm speaking as PedNet, what's PedNet's position on this current ballot initiative and the project list? And I'm gonna share that all with you. So we support it, we absolutely support it. Um, and the reason we support it is because we really do believe Parks and Rec make a good faith effort to balance investments across multiple interests and ward needs. We think they're really doing a, a pretty good job. Um, but more than that, we think they're very good stewards of taxpayer dollars. Um, as I mentioned, they create a list of the projects they are going to complete over that cycle. And I don't know of an instance they haven't met their promises. And so because of that, we think they're going to do a really good job with their, the money. We know that parks, uh, all parks facilities are a huge net benefit to our community. And so we, we support them and, and, and their efforts. We particularly support the Percy Creek Trail Fate Trail Phase Two and the Hinkson Creek Clark Lane to Vanderveer. So that's the those are the trails that are already line itemed out to be built over the next ten years. So we do support those heavily. However, we do have some recommendations, and this is kind of where I really would hope if you guys have lots of questions, please ask. Um, I do want to make a note that we are not against the sports field house. We are not against the uh, fairgrounds. I know it may come off as me sounding like that. We are simply using those as examples to show that the budgeting is not necessarily matching up with what the community has asked for and what the community uses on the most regular. Um, in a previous park sales tax, uh, for example, the, the sports field house, the phase one, it was built in that cycle, in the last cycle. However, they did not fully fund the field house with only park sales tax dollars. They got dollars from Conventioners Visitors Bureau, they got some donations um, and that was that's wonderful. But in this one, they are fully funding it. And as I mentioned, we don't think it totally matches up. So we're not saying we're not gonna ask city council or Parks and Rec to remove those. Um, and what we are hoping is that by working with Parks and Rec and working with city council, we can find ways to either increase the funding towards the park sales tax or find other ways for funding some other facilities. So what are we gonna recommend? Because we truly don't believe 2.5 miles over the next 10 years is, is quite good enough. Uh, we wanna see more. Um, so we are going to ask, and we have started to ask, we've had meetings with city council, we've had meetings with parks and rec and they've been wonderful and open. Um, to us having these conversations, but we are asking that they all revise the 2021 park sales tax project list to include the following three trails in priority order, um, because we really do think that these trails have a priority. We are huge fans of the Colt Railroad Trail. That would go from College Avenue to Brown Station. That's a 3.5 mile trail. We are huge fans of that one. Um, it has huge equity implications. It's in an area that does not have good trail access. It's in an area that does not have safe walking and biking access. 
And we know that in this area, lots of people walk and bike. It's along Paris Road, which is incredibly dangerous. And so we love the Colt Railroad Trail. Bear Creek Trail, that would go from Blue Ridge to Brown Station Road. If you look on my little map here, I'll get my mouse going. That's this more Northern one here. That would start at Oakland Park essentially, and then go up and connect to the fairgrounds is really what it would do. We love this one too, because it gives great access to the second ward. It also connects the fairgrounds. It connects Oakland Middle School. It connects the park, it connects the swimming pool. It connects Lang. It goes through several neighborhoods. So we love this one as well. And then the Hinkson Creek Trail, Brown Station to Colt. That's this one kind of over here on the, more on the right side of the screen, this little section right here. And the reason we like that one, one, it's short. It's only 0.75 miles. But with this Hinkson Trail, Hinkson Creek Trail, if you can see, I'm just kind of circling. This is the one that's gonna be, that's already slated to be built in the next 10 years. So it will come up to this little black line here, and that's where it was supposed to terminate. However, if we build this section, this three quarters of a mile section over to the Colt, we will get a total of additional 6.5 miles of trail added to the park sales tax list in the next 10 years. Um, what's also really great about this is when you add it to the trails that are currently on the list, we'll end up getting about nine miles of trail over the next 10 years. This rate is much closer and aligns much better with Columbia Parks and Rec's internal goal of building one mile of trail per year. So that's an internal goal they've tried to maintain. Um, obviously 2.5 miles over the next 10 years does not maintain that goal. This however does. And just for people, I'm gonna slip back to this other slide. People always ask me, well, how much more money is that? Um, the general rule of thumb when building trails is you say it's $1 million per mile. So this would add an additional $6.55 million to the project list. Um, however, there are many things we could try to do to figure out how to get that funding in um, and hoping that Parks and Rec and Columbia City Council can come up with some, some great strategies on how to get those added in. So if we were to build all those three trails that we are recommending, the Colt Railroad, the Hinkson, that little three quarters of a mile Hinkson Creek and the Bear Creek extension, that would complete this entire corner of the 30 mile loop. If you can see my mouse going there, it would complete that entire corner as well as filling in the Colt Railroad, giving great access from people from both the third, whoop, Slides are flying all over the place here. Sorry about that. It would give great access for the, the third and second ward, particularly in some areas that don't have great transportation access to downtown. Um, so we absolutely love this idea of completing that corner that includes a section of the, the Colt Railroad. Uh, are any of these trails on the priority two list? No, um, I'll answer that question, they are not. Um, However, the, they've had discussions about putting the Colt Railroad on the priority two, two list. And, and D, the reason we, we thought about like, hey, let's, let's push to just try to get these on that priority two list. The reason we're not excited about trying to push to get them just on the priority two list is because historically, um, and, and what D means by that is if Parks and Rec uh, saves a bunch of money over the cycle of the sales tax and or more money is generated than they thought would be generated from the revenue. They go to their priority two list and they look and they say, okay, what on this priority two list can we build? And the reason we're not excited about that is one, the priority two list is huge. It has so many things on it besides just trails. Also the money generated has never gone really above and beyond what was estimated. So they've never really jumped over and, and pulled anything off the priority two list. And so we felt like that was a bit of a gamble in just trying to say, hey, get these on the priority two list, if that makes sense. So it would complete this entire corner. Um, and then if this entire corner was completed, starting here at Cosmo Park, in the next 10 years, if that was built, you would be able to take Bear Creek that is already constructed, the new Bear Creek extension up to the fairgrounds, 
jump on this little section of the colt right here, the three quarter mile section of the, the Hinkson that we're asking for, there's a pedway already built right here. And then the Hinkson Creek Trail that is slated already, it's already line itemed out, would bring you down here to socket. And then within the next year, the Hinkson Creek North here will be completed. This is part of the last sales tax initiative. That should be completed. Zip around Stevens Lake Park, go through the uh, Moon Valley, get on Shepherd to Rollins, and then come down here and then you're on the MU wreck, the grindstone, all of that business till you hit the MKT, you'll come out past Jay Dix. Within the next year and a half, this section here of the Percy extension, so Percy phase one will be complete. And then in the next 10 years, that's already slated would be the phase two. So you would be able to ride really three quarters of this trail, if not more. Um, Avery, I'll get to your question here in a second. It looks like one I have to use my brain for instead of just spouting off an answer. So give me a second. So um, what we're doing now, just so you all know, is we, we feel like, because as I talked at the beginning, that the park sales tax really is the way we build trails here in Columbia, especially moving forward since we're missing out on the, the get about funding has gone away. Other communities, have dedicated funding, uh, dedicated quite a bit of funding really to their, their trail system to build it out. In the years past, we've really leaned on that get about funding. However, it has gone away, but the community still wants more trails. It's the trails we, we use the most, the things we use the most often. Um, and so we would like to see that 30 mile loop built a little bit faster. And so what we have started doing is having conversations, as I mentioned with Parks and Rec, having parks conversations with city council, and everybody seems to be very, very intrigued by the idea. They, they get it, they've seen the numbers, they wanna see what we can do. Um, as I've asked them about like how supportive of you are you of these things, um, Parks and Rec has, has kind of told me they need a council directive. They really want council, city council to say, put these three trails on the project list. And so as we've talked to city council, city council has said, yeah, we like the idea, um, we really love the ideas. We think it makes a lot of sense. It, 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 the putting the tree, three trails on there really matches more up with what the community is wanting. Um, what they really want is they want to make sure they have the backing of the community saying, yes, we do want more trails. We do want these things built. And they have said they want to hear from the public. And so over the next month, essentially, we are going to ask you all on this call, as well as every single person that I talk to on the streets, um, to please send a letter to the city council asking for these trails. Um, and we have a link that allows you to, it will auto-generate a, a letter for you. And I will have Gabby here in a second show, share that. Um, so now until August 16th, huge letter writing campaign. We're trying to get letters sent to the mayor from the city council. Um, and we need these letters to come from businesses, clubs, organizations, and individuals. Um, it only goes so far when we at PedNet go in and talk to them. And that's because they know we love these things. They hear from us all the time. Uh, we're at all the meetings. And now they've said, well, okay, bring out the public. Let the public tell us this is what they want as well. And so we really have estimated that we need anywhere from two to 500 letters written to city council by August 16th showing support for these trails. On August 16th, the other thing they have said they need is, and this is absolutely true, we see it happen all the time when we're doing our work at city council, is oftentimes city council votes based on who's in the room. And so they have said, bring everybody you know to city council on August 16th at 7 p.m. Um, to speak in favor, adding these additional trails to the project list, because this is the night they're going to vote on the actual list. And so I hope that everybody that's on this call will, will do a save the date and plan to be there on August 16th at 7 p.m. Um, here in a second, as I mentioned, I'm going to have Gabby put in the link. If you wanna send your letter tonight, to city council, it's super easy. All you do is you click on it. Uh, it takes you to a page where it collects your name, 
your, your street address. That way they know which ward you live in, your email, so they know it's from a real person. And then you can edit the letter if you want, or you can just send it as it is. You just hit send and it goes off to every council member and the mayor. So uh, Gabby, um, go ahead and put that in the, the list there or in the, the chat for me. I'm gonna read Avery's question real quick and see if I can't answer that. Uh, it feels like the orange spur off the Hinkson Creek Trail would be better facilita facilitated trail access to low and medium income families than the Mexico gravel to Bear Creek extension. Feels like the spur, the orange spur off the Hinkson Trail. Um, I'm gonna, hey, uh, Avery, if you wanna unmute yourself, um, I'm gonna bring up that, that picture again. I'm trying to figure out where you're, you're talking about here and I wanna answer your question. Can you go back one more, please? There? Just one more. Yeah, there we go, yep. So the orange spur uh, where the K in Hinkson Creek is. Right here? Yep, that spur. So that's a connector trail um, mm -hmm. is what that is. So those are a little bit easier to get put on and built. So um, yes, you're, you're not wrong that it would be a huge access point. What we like about this is one, it completes the loop. Without this, that, that whole corner would not be connected. I'm gonna jump back here to the other page real quick. So without that, this there'd be a gap right here. So you'd be able to do everything until you got to here, and then you'd be kind of in no person's land to then get to here. So it completes the whole corner. This here's a connector. Um, those can usually be built with some of their other funds. So in that miscellaneous section, um, or in any kind of redevelopment funds. So I, I doubt this one will ever actually get put on any kind of like full line item list. Does that make sense to you? Because it's so yep. tiny. Yep, so that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. I'm not necessarily, as this is Ted and good to see you, Ted. Um, I'm not necessarily against this proposal, but aren't there factors other than funding that affect whether a trail is built or not, things such as land acquisition and right of way? Yeah, absolutely, there is. And, and we see that all the time with trails. And this is the same for any trail. This is pretty much, this, this, this goes also for the current trails that are on the list. Uh, a couple of them, they've already started to work that out, but this happens all the time. Um, there's really not much we can do to get around that. Um, but I know that's not a real great answer to your question, Ted, but we see this every trail project we ever do is, yeah, we gotta do land acquisition and right of way. And as, as, as it relates to adding to the cost, that million dollars I said, when you build a trail, that, that has part of that in there um, is the rough estimate, give or take. And that also, that million dollars, you know, some trails have more bridges, so they go up, some trails are easier, the, the, the pricing goes down. So it's always averaged out at about a million dollars, but yeah. Thank you, John, for sending your, your message. Uh, any other questions? I'd love to answer some questions. I have a comment. If that's... Sure. So... Oh, sorry. You... Yeah, I'm totally in support of this. We'll write a letter, et cetera. But I also have been following the land acquisition fund, which got slashed due to COVID, whereas not much else got slashed. And uh, I don't think that's, I don't like that treated as just a loose change door or slush fund, you know, if we happen to have money and we need to buy land. The whole sales tax started because we were trying to save Stevens Lake Park from development. And that is gonna keep going on with Columbia. So it's also important that the parks respects that fund and maybe, can buy land such as what we're trying to protect around Gans, uh, Rock Ridge State Park and Gans Wild area. So I think both trails and land acquisition are very important and shouldn't be cut. Yeah, I agree with you. Should be increased actually. Yeah, I completely agree. Thank you, thank you, Dee. Uh, let's see, Tom, are letters from county residents relevant? Absolutely, um, you know, Columbia is a hub. Um, that it's the fact of the matter. I mean, we have the county, the courthouse here, it's, it's the seat of the county. And so Columbia is, is used by the entire county. So 
having some, oh, Tom, I just see that you sent that as a direct message to me. So not everybody seeing your question, but yes, are letters from county residents relevant? Yes, they absolutely are as I'm, as I'm saying it. Um, also, um, the city works with the county through an organization or a department called the Columbia Area Transit Study Organization. And what this is, is kind of the gray area between the city and the county. And that gray area is, is technically county, uh, but it's county that's probably gonna be city soon. And so we need to make sure we, we keep those residents really in mind as we do a lot of our development and our funding because those residents just outside our city limits will, may, will probably be residents someday soon. Um, but as I mentioned, residents that live maybe further out come to Columbia, they use trails. So absolutely, Tom, please write a letter. And if you know anybody outside of the, in the county, have them as well. Okay. You guys are so, taking it uh, easy on me. Oh, go ahead, Frank. Yeah, so this, this is Frank. Um, one of the things that you're gonna run into some pushback with the statistics of use is that statistics of use are age dependent. Kids play Starker starting at five and they quit at 20, but a large percentage of kids and families in that age bracket do that. Uh, trails are something you can use till you're 100, and uh, so the, just the statistics about who uses it as a percent of the total population can get you into a roundabout of uh, who, who actually counts. Yeah, absolutely. Whenever you're doing statistics, there's always a, a little tit for tat back and forth between which part of the statistic you're in favor of more. So, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? We still have seven whole minutes um, for me to answer any questions. And it could be non-park sales tax related. I'm happy to answer anything about biking, walking, public transit in Columbia. Okay. Well, I don't want everybody to have to sit in silence for, for seven minutes. Um, and so I, I thank everybody for, for joining the call or the Zoom as it is tonight. Uh, we we're very happy with the number of people we had. We weren't sure how one of these talks would actually go. Um, so that was really wonderful for joining us on our Let's Chat. Um, Gabby, if you wouldn't mind putting that link in there one more time, if someone didn't get it and wants to click on it as we kind of end the, the Zoom meeting, they can go and fill that out and send something on to council. That would be wonderful. You will be getting lots of emails from us through our, our newsletter um, requesting that you know that you, you that you send a letter to city council, but also very 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 important is showing up to that city council meeting on August 16th at 7 p.m. and we'll be sending out plenty of reminders asking people to do that um, because with, without the support of the community, um, you know, oftentimes we we when we talk to city council, um, you know they tell us that the reason we've been so so, so successful as, as an organization is because we luckily hit on a vision and mission that so many people in Columbia believe in and that they hear about it and that they need to continue to hear about it. And so the more of you that can send letters and show up to that council meeting, the more trails we can continue to build in Columbia, we can get that 30 mile loop done so that John, as he said, he won't be 93 when he gets to actually use it. So. Um, so thank you. And um, if you have any questions, I'm gonna jump real quick back to that last slide. Don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, that's my cell phone. You can call or text me. You can send me an email and I'll be happy to talk to you. If you know of a group that would like to hear me talk or give this presentation, um, who would be willing to sign the letter. Individuals are superb, um, but it's also really nice to get organizations or businesses to sign on for support as well because they bring a whole different angle than just the individual so please reach out and i'm happy to give those talks our next presentation gabby i'm going to put you on the spot um our next one of these let's chat presentations will is again the second wednesday of the month and so that would be in august uh, gabby do you know what the the topic is for that month All right, so August, it's going to be the 11th, 
and it should be uh, Heather with Confident City Cycling. Okay. Um, yeah, Heather's a, a, a league certified cycling instructor. And so she will be talking through the, the rules of the road, the best practices of the road, and kind of trying to help people that may not be so confident out riding on the road. Some of the techniques that'll help them feel safe, but also help them feel confident while riding their bikes uh, amongst traffic. So with that, everybody, thank you so very much. And I hope you have a wonderful Wednesday evening. See you all later. Can I ask you a question? Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, just about, I was told that it, this is gonna be on first read for city council Monday. Right. But then the vote is a month later. Yeah, so what they're gonna do is they're doing a, a first read on Monday. And then on August, I'm gonna get the date way wrong, two weeks before second. the 16th. So the August like second, thank you. August 2nd, they are going to vote to put the park sales tax on the ballot. Okay. So that's the thing that'll vote to go on the ballot on August 2nd. But on August 16th is when they vote to approve the project Ooh, list. Okay. And the project list is what we want okay. to say these additional uh, trips. Uh, uh, uh. So, all right. Hey, Lawrence, who do you call to get the, the university park trail fixed? Uh, you, you got to call MU. I don't know the exact number, but if you call either Parks and Rec, they, they are really good at hooking you up. Or if you go to the city's report a problem um, on their website, I find that that is very useful. So you go to the city council, or excuse me, not council, city of Columbia's website. On the left side, you kind of scroll through there. There's a thing that's called report a problem. Um, and there will okay. be a section that talks about uh, alternative mode or, or yeah alternative modes of transportation or non-motorized excuse me non-motorized transportation and that's in there you can see really bad. yeah yeah it's real bad so mm -hmm. thank you for that john that's who you would what i would do okay thank now, you is it november that um this would be on the ballot i assume so it is uh, november yes that this will go on the ballot okay all right all right, thanks, John. Thanks, D. All right, everybody. Thank you very much. Have a great evening.